If you can stay standing for the word of God. John, the seventh chapter. John 7. I'm going to read verses 37 and 38. John 7, verses 37 and 38. It says this. On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart or out of his belly will flow rivers of living water. You may be seated in the presence of God. Our subject today is thirsty. Thirsty. Uh, there was a study that was conducted in 2015 uh, by the Nutrition Information Center that found that nearly 75% of all Americans are chronically dehydrated. Uh, it, is, it is ironic <clears throat> that although we are living uh, in this information age, we are living in the day of Google where knowledge is available at the click of a button, but somehow we still suffer from one of the most preventable of health issues in North America. It seems that although uh, information is coming in faster than ever, the application of that information isn't happening at the same speed. And what good is information without the actual application? We have become, we've become hoarders of information, but many suffer from its actual use. But, but dehydration occurs when you use or lose more fluid than you take in. And so in extreme cases, um, dehydration can actually lead to fatigue, it can lead to dizziness, it can lead to disorientation. These are preventable problems. All you gotta do is take a drink. Look at somebody and say, take a drink. I'm preaching to myself today. Take a, take a drink. Uh, but most people, the problem is that most people don't even know that they are dehydrated. In fact, by the time that you are actually thirsty, it is an indication that you are already dehydrated. If you wait to feel thirsty to drink, it means that you respond to crisis, but lack the foresight to enable preventative measures. Just keep drinking. Look at somebody and say, just keep drinking. In John chapter 7, we find that Jesus has gone to the temple during the Feast of Tabernacles. It's also known as the Feast of Booths. And he begins to teach in the temple. The Feast of Tabernacles, for those who do not know, it is a memorial to remind the Israelites of the building of booths during their wilderness journey. It, it served as an annual reminder to the people of God um, that, that he is the great shepherd who has chosen to tabernacle among them and to protect and bless them wherever they go. It is known as a season of joy. But I have a spoiler alert for those who are in Christ Jesus and have received the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Our joy does not last for a season. Let me say it again, our joy does not last for a season, but we have an everlasting joy that is a byproduct of the Holy Spirit. We have a joy, I wish we had some season saints, they would say that the world didn't give it, and if the world didn't give it, then the world can't take it away. We have a joy that is not temporal. It is not temporary. We have an eternal joy, one that is not circumstantial, but one that is concrete. It is fixed. It is a sure thing. It is joy unspeakable. Joy, it's inexplicable. Joy, it's unfathomable. Joy, it is joy that just don't make no kind of sense. And this joy is not just enough, but our joy is overflowing. Look at somebody and say, the joy overflows. Come on, tell them the joy overflows. It's overflowing in the midst of sorrow. It's overflowing in the midst of sickness. It's overflowing in the midst of chaos. It's overflowing in the midst of confusion. It's overflowing in the midst of adversity. Our joy has been made full to overflow. Look at somebody and say, I still got joy. During this feast, during this feast for 
for seven consecutive days, they would take a golden pitcher and go down to the pool of Siloam and fill it with water and bring it into the temple ceremoniously to pour it out. And in doing so, they were reminded of how God provided water for them in the desert. After these seven days was a day of celebration. Y'all tracking with me? The last day of the feast, the great day, was the eighth day. And it is on this eighth day where we find that Jesus cries out to a crowd in the midst of a celebration. Jesus interrupts their temporary religious ritual with an invitation to celebration that has no end. They are celebrating what was. Jesus has invited them to what is and what is to come. Their eyes are focused on what God did, but Jesus wants to show them what God is doing. Never look backwards longer than you're gonna look forward. You should be able to learn from the past. You should celebrate the past. You can even memorialize the past, but you cannot dwell in the past. Looking back should cause you your faith to rise now in anticipation of what he will do next. Looking back should cause your praise to increase now as you consider his next great move. Looking back should be used to encourage your, your spirit in this season while you eagerly anticipate what he's going to do in the next season. We only look back to move forward. Jesus, he, he interrupts their feast. He, he disrupts their celebration. He, he busts up the party with a revolutionary announcement. And Jesus can do this because the underlying message that he was conveying to the people is that I am greater than your temporary celebration. In fact, Jesus was the fulfillment. He was the, the culmination. He is the grand finale of the feast. Can we talk about Jesus? The Feast of the Tabernacle celebrated the provision of God in the wilderness. It celebrated the fact that he stayed with them through the wilderness. But when Jesus steps on the scene, John declares that Jesus, the Word, became flesh and tabernacled among us. In other words, he leaves the throne of God and comes to earth to become the tabernacle of God amongst us. And then he becomes sin that, that we might become the tabernacle of God, that we might become his dwelling place. And this is the message that Jesus shouts through the crowd in celebration. He calls out to them to bring a message that if received will change the trajectory of the rest of their lives. And he begins this message with two transformational words. If anyone, somebody shout if anyone. Shout it, if anyone. if anyone. If being a word of condition. Anyone, anyone being a word without condition and they're married together to form the foundation of what Jesus would offer to anyone who hears. The strength and the power of anyone may be lost on us now, but I need you to call to remembrance that he is speaking to a Jewish crowd doing a high, holy celebration that is strictly for them. And he starts his statement with the words, if anyone. Now, some of y'all, I knew this was going to happen. Some of you don't know your real shouting moments. We miss the moments when we ought to give God the greatest praise that we can muster up because the fact that he says anyone means that you and I were included in the plan of God. I wish y'all knew your Bible. Up until this point, it has been all about the chosen people. And as I look around this room, none of y'all were a part of that crowd. It has been about genealogy. It has been about pedigree. It's been about DNA. But now Jesus says that I am extending this invitation to anyone. Somebody shout anyone. From the greatest of them to the least of them, anyone. From the rich to the poor, anyone. From the free to the slave, from the black to the white, from the educated to the uneducated, from the old to the young. He leaves no man out. He leaves no woman out. And he says, anyone. 
Here's the part that most of us don't get. Anyone was extended to Jesus' enemies who were trying to kill him. Anyone was extended to Paul who was a persecutor of Christians. Anyone was extended to religious leaders like Nicodemus who was associated with the very people who sought to destroy him. Anyone was extended to the Samaritan woman who was a foreigner with a rocky past. Anyone was extended to Peter with his cussing and fighting self. Anyone includes anyone who is listening to this message right now. Anyone includes you. Look at somebody and say, anyone includes you. Now, can you give him 30 seconds of praise real quick for being included in the anyone? Come on, some of y'all act like, like you deserve to be here right now. I wish we had a people who were true about who you actually are. But he looked beyond your faults. He looked beyond your wayward ways. And he decided to include you despite you. Come on. To the liar, he says anyone. To the cheater, he says anyone. To the thief, he says anyone. To the fornicator, he says anyone. To the adulterer, he says anyone. To the manipulator, he says anyone. To the the immoral, he says, anyone. He included you. And the anyone. He says, if anyone thirsts, come. If anyone thirsts, come. Thirst is thirst is universal. Everyone has experienced it. Now, the, the issue with this is, is that spiritual thirst presents itself similarly to that of physical thirst. You aren't always aware that you're thirsty. You can move as if, as if everything is okay and not realize that you are actually thirsty because you are, you are spiritually dehydrated well before you're aware of the fact that you need to take a drink. And if we trace our dry seasons and tell the truth, there were signs along the way, but we ignored them. Hello. We pretended that it was all good until we couldn't ignore it any longer. But I, if I can take this one step further, some of us do recognize that we are in fact thirsty. But what we reach for to quench our thirst can actually dehydrate us even further. All right, talk. So instead of reaching for the water that you so desperately need, you reach for the soda instead. The trickiest part about that is in the moment you feel satisfied. But you don't realize that the caffeine and the sugar are just adding in things that will further dehydrate you. And there are some of us who are reaching for the wrong things even in our spiritual thirst. We reach for people instead of prayer. All right. We reach for power instead of humility. We reach for the wisdom of man instead of the wisdom of God. We reach for stale religion instead of relationship. And when it's all said and done, none of it keeps us satisfied. So you keep reaching and consuming more of it in order to satiate your thirst, but none of it can satisfy. You need a drink from the living water and his name is Jesus. Look at somebody and say, his name is Jesus. Drink and you will be satisfied. The, the provision is from him, but the responsibility is on us. Let, let, me, let me speak your language. He's buying the drinks, but you got to show up. Now y'all don't know what I'm talking about. Okay. Right. Coming down your row. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A river that, that, that runs through the desert only benefits the one who will bend down to drink. You have to take advantage of your access. And the access that we have to this offering is in our nearness to him. The Bible says that if we, if we draw near to God, he, he draws near to us. And many of us are sitting on the outside. We are, we are on the outskirts of what the Lord is doing, and he's inviting you in. He's giving you a seat at the table, but you got to actually show up. 
He is inviting us into a space of relationship. He is inviting you to a space of intimacy that satisfies the thirsting soul. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ in its simplest form. Jesus extends himself to those who don't deserve it simply because he loves us. Let me say it again. He extends himself to those who do not deserve it. Raise your hand real quick. That's you. Simply because he loves us, not because you worked for it, not because you earned it, not because you deserved it, not because you're going to do right after you receive it, but because I love you, I'll satisfy you. What an amazing love. What, what a complete love. What a perfect love. What a boundless love that Jesus has for us that despite our wrongdoings, despite our misgivings, despite our giving ups, he still wants us to come and to take a drink. And as we look at verse 38, he does something. He says he, he goes from anyone to whoever. He goes from anyone to whoever. The invitation is broad, but the result is specific. If you want to quench your thirst once and for all, the answer is in your belief. Mm -hmm. Jesus makes a promise, and the promise is available to anyone, but it's reserved for whoever believes in him in accordance to Scripture. Going to church does not grant you access to the promise. Oh, Lord Jesus. Fulfilling religious rituals doesn't grant you access to the promise. Singing and dancing does not grant you access to the promise. Giving your money to the poor and feeding the hungry does not grant you access. But for those who believe in him... He makes us a promise. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, do you believe? Since God is a man that he should not lie, we stand firm knowing that every word that God has spoken, it shall come to pass. So to the believer, he makes a promise. He says that out of your heart, out of your belly will flow rivers of living water. God is, is never satisfied in just filling your thirst. His, his desire is that you are not just full, but that you are full to the point of running over. He wants you to have a my cup runneth over experience. God does not do anything halfway. What he, what he has is more than enough, and he gives liberally to all who ask in faith. This water cannot be compared to any other waters. It cannot be compared to the dead waters of the Dead Sea. That water had no life in it. It cannot be compared to stagnant waters. It cannot be compared to stale waters. But this is the living water. Somebody shout living water. It's springing up. It is a source of life to all who would drink of it. Somebody shout living water. But notice this, notice this. He gives liberally, not just to fatten you up or for you to live in abundance solely, but I want you to pay attention to the direction that this water flows. He says, out of your heart, not into your heart. Out of your heart, not into your heart. You drank from him and that was for you. But now the living water springing up in you flows out of you, and that's for somebody else. Man, I wish we had a mature church. If I told you that the water was about you, you would shout. But there's something that he has given me that's bigger than me. It's for everybody that I come in contact with. This is the direction of the waters that flowed from the doors of the temple in Ezekiel's vision. The flowing out of the temple and the rising until it overtakes everything that is in its path. That's what he calls us to. This river flows out of us to, to for others who are thirsty. The world is a desert land, a barren desert, and the people are dying of thirst. But you have the remedy. If you turn on the news, you can see it. 
If you look at your social media outlets, you can see it. And even unfortunately, sometimes even in the church, you can see it. You see a thirsty people who are looking for a remedy. But we are to be the rivers of living water that these dying people need so desperately. As they see Jesus in us through the fruit of the Spirit, they desire what we have. And we can tell them, come to Jesus and come and take a drink. I wish somebody was excited about the fact that now that I've been filled to the place of overflow, I have more than enough to pour out on somebody else. Now, let me, let me deal with the real issue in the room even right now. Many of us are fearful of being depleted or running on empty. But when you have taken a drink from the fountain that never runs dry, you recognize that you have more than enough to allow others to experience the goodness of the Lord through what he has given to you. You can tell them about the invitation that you have accepted so that they too can accept the invitation that has been extended to them. I'm going to keep saying it until the day that I pass. How can you drink of this water and not want to pour? Now the Lord continues. He continues to, to have me get back to this same point. And so I'll continue to say it until he tells me to let up. When Jesus speaks of the rivers of water, he is prophetically speaking about the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in each believer after the resurrection. You may believe in Jesus, I'm so concerned, but have you received the Holy Spirit? Look at somebody and say, have you received the Holy Spirit? In Acts chapter 19, Paul and Apollos meet some disciples in Ephesus, and Paul asked these, these disciples, have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? Sadly, these disciples answered no. Here's the saddest part of it all. They said, we have not even heard about the Holy Spirit. In other words, you can believe and receive Jesus but ignore and refuse or neglect the Holy Spirit. But the Bible says that he is available to us, that he is yours for the asking. Now look at that same person and say, did you ask for him? These same disciples who knew nothing about the Holy Spirit were told the truth of the Holy Spirit. And in that same moment, somebody shot the same moment. They were baptized in the Holy Spirit. And right where you are, I'm almost done, but right where you are, you have the opportunity to invite Jesus into your life and to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I want you to stand now. I want you to stand now. I want you to stand now. I don't think there's anything more important than what I'm speaking right now. There are many people who are going to church and have no power. Because the source of our power is the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And you've got to make room in your heart for the Holy Spirit of God. He is available to every believer. And to everyone who has chosen to take a drink from this man named Jesus. I want you to ready your hearts. I want you to ready your hearts. I want you to ready your hearts. For some of us who are saying, well, I was baptized before. Are you full? Are you full? We've been, the, or this whole week, we've, or the last couple of weekend, we've been, we've been preparing, we've been planning this whole evangelized thing. And that's a work that has to happen, but you can't do that work without the Holy Spirit. You can't do that work without him beginning to quicken your heart and to use your mouth as a mouthpiece for his glory. Isaiah 55 says this, worship team, you can come. It says this, I'm going to read this to you, and then I want you to really begin to open yourself and avail yourself to the, to the Lord. Isaiah 55 says this, it says, come everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and he who has no money, come buy and eat. He says, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. This is what he says, why do you spend your money for that which is not bread? 
and your labor on that which does not satisfy. He says, incline your ear and come to me. Hear that your soul may live, and I will make you an everlasting covenant. Somebody shout, I want to be a part of that. 